the whole water column is really important um, for the animals living down here because most of the food for the animals living down here on the bottom comes from the water column. And if you were tuned in, actually it was probably a couple hours ago now, you saw a little pile of brittle stars that was eating on, uh, eating on, feeding on <laughs> um, what looked like a ball of mucus um, that had a bunch of sediment in it. And that was probably what we call a sinker, or the thing they were feeding on, um, which is the discarded um, filter house of a larvacean, which is a midwater organism. They produce two different houses. One is an, the outer house or the outer filter that um, both of the houses are made of yep. mucus, but that outer house is a um, is designed to filter out the larger particles that the in the animal that is in the center of the two houses surrounding it. Um, they are not interested in some of those larger particles. So a lot of the marine snow or all these particles that you see in the water column. Um, they get trapped in that, and then when the it animal is done feeding, it just swims out of that house, and that house sinks down with all those particles attached to it. We call it a sinker. Um, and then, actually, that's a really good food source for animals on the bottom, such as the, the brittle stars we've been seeing everywhere, potentially sea urchins, too, although I'm not sure that they feed on them. So, yeah, now we're looking at this nice sea urchin. It looks like it has a... A uh, worm on one yeah, of those spines. Scale worm. Mm -hmm. scale uh, yeah, it's got yeah. a scale worm hanging on to the the distal end of one of those upward pointing spines. Um, and you guys saw a couple of these earlier, but I yeah, missed I what, did. And Chris, uh, what this one is. Yeah, Chris Ma had identified it in, as a Formosoma placenta, and Megan McCuller sent that in to us. I don't know if I can't remember. Megan, if you got that from a blog or... Yeah, it was from Chris's, Chris Chris's Ma's blog. Yeah. You can see on the lower left some of the structures called the pedicellaria. And actually, if you could... I don't know if we're able to zoom in any further. Probably this is our extent. But they're actually little stalked sets of jaws that occur on the upper side of some sea stars and sea urchins. And they... Their function is not totally understood as far as I know, but they potentially uh, remove um, particulates from settling on top of the sea star or on the sea urchin, and they could also potentially be used in feeding. Yeah. Hmm. But I think mostly it's to keep um, things from settling That's on the body of the animal. Hmm. Which it would need in this environment. Yeah, with all this marine snow coming down and, and settling. Sediment, yep. Yeah, just plain old sediment too. As close as I can get you. Yep, on it. Yep. Drive my tilt. Go back up ahead. So pedicellaria. So those are the modified. Yeah, so you can see those three or four along the the lower left. They have Actually. the little white stalks on the end. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yes. So it's just like little simple. Jaws. Hmm. They're really cool. Oh. Nice view of the scale worm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the tube feet that he's walking on are nice and stout. <laughs> yeah. Hey, when, when you saw the ones earlier, and did Chris get on the line and talk about these, like, inflated? No. Oh, the no, scale worms. Oh, he's bailing. Maybe he's going to go underneath. Pretty color. Yeah. No, um, we haven't heard from Chris Moss. Okay, I was yet. just wondering if, if I'm sure someone. Oh, you can see a pair of the jaws on the right side, right just above the worm, is open. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh, look at that. So keep huh. an eye on that, and you might, I don't know, might might be able to see it closing those. <laughs> oh, it looks like it's closing. That's funny. I guess it sensed the scale worm, and that would be, yeah, my. Copy that bridge, thanks. My presumption. There's also one on the upper right open as well. Mm hmm A little more oh inside. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, so you really have to look close at some of these animals to see some of the more 
fascinating features that they have going on. Yeah. Mushy mushy, Chris Ma. <laughs> Hello, Chris. How are you? Hi, Chris. We were just talking hey. about you. I'm sure your ears were burning. I don't know. In fact, I almost didn't call in because you guys are doing such a fine job of um, explaining this excellent kind of third urchin um, and all of the various details. Um, I only wanted to call in to add the fact that um, these large bulbous um, balloons that we're seeing on the top, um, Craig Young has looked at the function of these and um, has proposed that they function uh, in a defensive capacity as essentially large hypodermic needles. And we had talked about how echinothyroid urchins, also called pancake urchins, because of the fact that um, they have really uh, flexible tests and the fact that when they're brought up to the surface, the water evacuates from their body coelom very quickly, and so they flatten out immediately. <clears throat> but they have these really elaborate defensive mechanisms um, that are perhaps uh, related to to their shallow water um, relatives. But uh, but essentially, uh, these big balloons around these spines function, uh, it's thought, as hypodermic needles. And so, uh, you know, if we were to have collected one of these and brought them up, uh, whoever would be unfortunate <laughs> enough to, to deal with them <laughs> would unlikely get get nailed by one of these huh. or potentially could be nailed by one of these spines and wow. from what I'm told there's a very um, unpleasant se tingling sensation that sets in afterwards.